because he's been gracious and good towards us. Do I have a witness this morning? We thank you this morning for this opportunity to worship. Can we just give God praise for our music ministry this morning? Amen. The powerful way they minister. I want to invite you to Judges chapter 6 as we continue today to learn life lessons through the life of Gideon. And today we come to the second teaching in, in this series, The Future You. And I want to invite you today in considering for reading Judges 6, beginning at verse 12. We'll pick up there and we'll conclude at verse 16 of Judges chapter 6. Y'all ready? Sounds good. And remember these words. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Gideon said to him, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? Where are, are all his miracles which our father told us about saying, did not the Lord bring us out up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, go in this might of yours. And you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. I have sent you. So he said to him, oh, my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest of Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, surely I will be with you and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. I just want to lift up one more time this verse. So he said to him, oh my Lord, can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest of Manasseh. And I am the least in my father's house. Hmm. And I am the least in my father's house. Today I want to tag this text as the Holy Spirit shall guide us. And I want to talk about today living out of focus. Living out of of focus. You may be seated in the presence of our God. I want to ask a question as we begin our journey together through God's word. How many people in this room wear glasses? Let me see your hands. Oh my God, that's the whole church. Oh, contacts. Let me see your hands. You wear, yeah. <laughs> How you, many of you remember when you were first in need of glasses? <laughs> you were trying to read something, trying to look at something, trying to just walk around in general. You remember? It, isn't it amazing the crazy things we do when we're in need of glasses? Aisha, if you could put it up on the screen for me. Some of y'all remember that? And isn't it crazy before we would go to the eye doctor? and stuff like hold stuff way off <laughs> or others would pull it close in 
And some of you can remember just going around and trying to get around in general how you would oftentimes bump into stuff. Walk around, tough for you to get around. Trying to drive, squinting your eyes. When life was blurry for you. <laughs> and ultimately, that's what life looked like. That was your view. That's how you were trying to function. <laughs> that's how you were trying to go around. Blurry. Bumping into stuff. Squinting. Trying to drive and trying to, my God, you ought to just thank God for grace. That you ain't have accidents and need of glasses. Trying to read. And you often know that when you're in need of glasses and in that season of your life, it can create physical problems for you. It can create health problems. Tension and migraines and other kinds of ailments can be caused and stress can be caused simply behind the fact that things are out of focus for you. And then ultimately one day, you finally break down or somebody convinces you to go see an a eye doctor, an optometrist. And you go in, and then they start, everything starts looking like what it is on the screen right there. And then you go in and sit down in that chair Aisha, let's put up the next one. And you go in and, and then they put that thing, that machine over your eyes and they start asking you a series of questions. Does it look better on one, or two, three, or four? Or about the same? <laughs> And then when they hone in, and by the time you leave, things have come into focus. And my God, how differently the world looks when things are in focus. Can I suggest, Aisha, can we go back to the first one? Can I suggest for you this morning that until you see yourself the way God sees you, you are going through life functioning this way. Until you see yourself through the lens of how God sees you and for the unique purpose that he has created you for, you are literally functioning and going through life out of focus. And here's what's scary about this, is we are functioning in life out of focus, and this out of focus life for many has become normative. And so what happens is we grow up and we become out of focus adults. And as out of focus adults, then we marry another out of focus person. And so now we are blind leading the blind. And then what's even scarier is now we are blind leading blind. And my God, we start bringing other little people into the world. And now we are parents out of focus. And so there's no way I can raise a child that has focus and clarity about their purpose and who they are and how God has gifted and made them. And there's no way I can aim this arrow that I'm supposed to help guide their life when my life is out of focus. Because I've never discovered, I've never discerned how does God really see me? <laughs> I know what others have told me. I know the stuff and the hype that I've bought into about me. 
I know the negative things that people have portrayed about me. I know the falsehood of what society says about me. But I've never really clearly discerned what God sees and seeing myself the way God sees me. And I want to tell you, until you discern that, until you discover that, until you embrace that, your life will continue to be this way. Now I want to ask you a question. Do you want the life of number one? <laughs> Let's put up the other one, Aisha. Or do you want that life, number two? <laughs> That's exactly where Gideon is. Remember on last week, in this pit, in this wine press, he receives a divine visitation. And he's in this wine press, threshing wheat in the wine press, in a posture acting like a coward, but he receives a divine visitation. And the divine visitation comes and says, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Y'all remember that? That's the way God saw him that's the way God sees him even though there's nothing in his disposition there's nothing in his behavior right now that is demonstrating a mighty man of valor but this is how God sees him this is ultimately what God has made him to be and now God is extending him an invitation to become everything he has purposed and destined for Gideon to become. But now the moment and the time of tension is will Gideon embrace the calling that God is now extending to him and will he embrace the, the, the invitation and the vision that ultimately God has for his life or will he continue to live a life that is beneath him and out of focus for what God has ultimately created him for that now becomes the question and today I just want to explore for just a moment Gideon's response to what the divine angel who comes to visit him notice his response look at the verse and the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him the Lord is with you you mighty man of valor Gideon turns around and says this oh my Lord if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles which our father told us about saying, did the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him again, y'all, and said, Go in his might of yours and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So he said to him, oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest of Manasseh and I am the least in my father's house. Y'all, can't you, do you see this? Do you see it? Gideon couldn't see it. <laughs> Gideon couldn't see it. Gideon, he could not see it. When God is trying to bring his life into focus, Gideon could not see it. 
This becomes Gideon's biggest challenge, having the ability to see what God sees about him. And I think today that's not only Gideon's challenge. That's somebody's challenge in this room this morning. It becomes obvious by his response, doesn't it, y'all? Gideon just could not grasp. He could not fathom. He could not see what God sees. And so, like Gideon, you're going to continue to be out of focus and live a life out of focus until you can see what God sees. So I just want to ask a question this morning, a couple of things I want us to ponder together today. Why couldn't he see it? Why couldn't he see it? Huh. Why couldn't he see it? I believe the reason he couldn't see it is why you can't see it. Here it is. If you're taking notes, write this down. The first thing I want to suggest this morning, y'all, is Gideon has a lack of perception. Gideon has a lack of perception. Do you see the first thing that he utters out of his mouth? Now, here the angel of the Lord says, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Do y'all see what he offers up? Well, if the Lord is with us, why all this happen? <laughs> if the Lord is with us, why am I in this situation? If the Lord is with us, why does my life look like this? If the Lord is with us, where is he that performed all these miracles that brought us up out of Egypt? And look at where we are right now. Hmm? Then the angel rebuts and says, you go. I'm sending you to save Israel. How can I go save Israel? Do you know where I'm from? <laughs> Do you know where I'm from? And then on top of where I'm from, I'm the least... In my father's house. Hmm? Do y'all see it? Gideon lacks perception. Gideon denies everything that God is telling him. <laughs> Gideon, y'all, is guilty of living by sight. And not by faith. See, it's unfortunate, y'all, that Gideon couldn't see God working, nor could he see the people's wrong. Isn't it interesting, y'all? Remember, I told you from the very beginning, y'all remember I told you last week the hideous cycle that the children of Israel had succumbed to? God done delivered them out of Egypt, brought them into the land of the promise. And God told them, I'm going to be your only God. Serve me and serve me only. But what do they do? They get into the promised land and then they start turning what? Over to idol worship. They start worshiping other gods and they start worshiping Baal. And so what does God do? God says, okay, you're going to choose Baal over me. Then guess what? You're going to have to reap the bit. You're going to have to reap the consequences from your own decision. If you're going to go and worship Baal, then you let Baal feed you. You let Baal provide for you. You let Baal protect you. Since you're going to go and make sacrifices to Baal, then you let Baal look Look out for you. You let Baal protect you from the minute. I say, here's the crazy thing. They started worshiping the God of Baal, the God of the Midianites. Would you look at that? And the same gods that they turned to to worship like the pagans, guess what? The pagans turned on them. And here they are. They are blaming God for their present predicament. For their choices. Oh, Y'all ain't going to like me here. For their choices. They're blaming God. For their 
disobedience. But they're blaming God. Don't that sound like us? Hmm? Blaming God, holding, passing the buck to everybody else and not taking ownership of our choices. You dated the joker. You gave them your number. You decided to sleep with them. You want to blame the devil. You want to blame God. You want to blame everybody but you signed the dotted line and knew you didn't have the money to be able to pay it. You got yourself in debt. You, you did all of that. Now here you are wanting to blame God for your present predicaments and not taking ownership of the choices. Look at somebody say the choices you've made in life. He lacks perception. He's denying what God is inviting him to. He's guilty of living by sight and not by faith. Gideon is lacking focus. Ooh. Gideon couldn't see God working or he couldn't see his people's mistakes and flaws that has caused them to be where they are. There's somebody in this room right now that lacks perception. <laughs> You're interpreting the events and the circumstances of your life from a distorted lens. But today God wants to bring you into focus. Today God wants to get you from blurry, out of blurry into clarity. Is there somebody in this room can remember a time in your life where you were living out of focus? Causing you to date knuckleheads? Ending up in all kind of jacked up relationships? Come on, talk to me somebody. Out of financial focus, you lack perception. Out of career focus, but you, because you weren't clear on who you were. My God, can somebody remember all the ways you settled in life for things and people that were beneath you? Do I have a witness in here? But can somebody right now thank God for God ushering you into a place of focus and clarity? And now you can testify that how amazing his grace was because you can remember when you were blind but somebody can thank God today that now I can see it's amazing grace anybody's testimony in the room today thank God for God's grace and high five your neighbor and say neighbor I can see clearly now somebody ought to thank God that you are now growing into a place where you are wiser and you're better and you are more clear than ever before do I have a witness or you are clear on who you are and who God is calling you to be and if God is bringing your life into focus right now then you ought to just take about 10 seconds and give him a praise that things are less blurry now for you. And God is bringing you into clarity. Gideon couldn't see it, y'all. Because one, he lacked perception. But then two, when you look at verses 15 and 16, Gideon couldn't see it in himself. Whew. Speak to us, Holy Spirit. So he said, oh my Lord, how can I save Israel indeed my clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I listen to what he says about himself am the least in my father's house I'm the least I'm the least in my father's house he couldn't see it in himself he couldn't see how God could use him to accomplish something great for him. He couldn't see it in himself. 
Gideon questioned why God would want to use him. I know, I know, I know. It's going to get real quiet right along in here. Because some of, our, some of us, our biggest hang-ups is the simple fact that you can't see yourself being used by God. You can't get past you. I really could give an altar call right here. You can't get past you. You hear the invitation. You hear the calling. And your greatest struggle, your greatest tension, I, I can't see myself being used by God. <laughs> because of your own proclivities, your own insecurities, because of your own sinfulness, you can't seem to get past you. And what Gideon says, this ain't nothing you talk about. This ain't nothing you testify about. Matter of fact, here's how the enemy dupes us because really you're ashamed that you even think this way about yourself. So you never really get to a place of freedom and deliverance and allowing God to really use you because you can't get past you. And so what you do is you sit year after year and you keep suppressing the calling and the invitation that God is extending to you. And you keep showing up and coming to church hoping that that is going to pacify God. You're hoping God is just going to be pacified with you choosing not to accept his invitation. And so here's the unfortunate thing. Here's the scary thing. Here's the sad thing. God is extending you an invitation to come and to come and be. And I'm going to make you more, you mighty man of honor, because you can't see it. You're still stuck in on the old you, the you you used to be, and the you you're struggling with right now. That you never step out in faith and trust God that He can make you into the you He wants you to become I told you last week we ended here I hope you're getting it that there's more to you there's more to you there's more to you but the scary and the unfortunate thing is there are far too many few people in the room that will settle for a life and not come and embrace the more that God wants you to become can I tell you that there is more? I'm excited that you're here and I'm glad you're sitting in that seat. But I want to let you know that that's just the step. See, and far too many of us in church, we think, okay, now I'm in church. They done been begging me, fussing at me all my life to get in church. And now I'm here. Okay, I'm here now. And I just want you to know that you getting here is just the beginning. <laughs> it's just the beginning. It's just the beginning. It ain't the end all. You think you done done something because you showing up every week. Showing up every week is necessary. But I want to let you know 
that there's an invitation. <laughs> there's some stretching. There's a purpose <laughs> that God has for you. Okay, yeah, Pastor, I tithe, I give. I know that's good. But there's more. <gasps> there's more. Do you hear me? There is more. And I know you, do you see everything getting in the response is by a question. <laughs> I know. You got, you got a whole lot of questions. Huh? If, 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 God, if God is who he said, why all this stuff happened? All he got is questions. How, how God going to use me to save Israel and I'm hiding in this pit? I'm scared to death. And he talking about I'm a mighty man of valor. How he going to use me like that? How, 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 how he going to use me to teach? And I'm scared to talk to people. Calling to preach, and I don't even like being in front of people. My wife will tell you. By nature, I'm an introvert. I'm not the extrovert in the relationship my wife is. By nature, I'm an introvert. I'll be in the company of people, and I don't have to talk. Hmm? When we travel and when we're on planes, I don't want to be bothered. That's me. When we're traveling, I get on the plane, I put my headphones on, I pull out my iPad, and I want to read. I don't want to, I don't want to get to know you. This is a short flight. I don't want to talk to you. That's me. My wife. She'll sit next to the person, and they're in a full-blown conversation. <laughs> By the time we get off the flight, she know where they're from, where they're going, how long they're going to be there, and they done talked and became friends. <laughs> and anytime time I want to know something about what's going on with somebody else, I, my wife will get it for me. <laughs> then here I am when we get in the car, what they say, what they say, what they say. <laughs> <laughs> Right? But most of us never accept God's yes because of our own insecurities. That's what Gideon is. Gideon couldn't see it in himself. And there's somebody here, you're saying, but, but Pastor, you don't know what I've done. You don't know the kind of things I struggle with. You don't know the kind of sins I battle. You don't know the kind of thoughts I have. God does. And guess what? He's still calling you. <laughs> because God, while he accepts you where you are, guess what? He don't want you to stay where you are. He wants you to get to the you he sees. See, there's a you he sees in the end that he had already designed from your beginning. He's just trying to get you to catch up to where he is already with you. I wish I had somebody in the room. And the question is this morning, are you going to get past you? Gideon couldn't see it, but thank God he's going to eventually get there. But I don't want to give you the cliff of the sermon and the series too soon. But the question is, are you going to get over you? And look at your name and say, neighbor, you got to get over yourself. You got to get over yourself. You got to get over the mistakes that you've made in your past. You got to get over your flaws. You got to get over your struggles. I need somebody to hear me. The Holy Spirit sent me this morning as your divine invitation to tell you, you got to get over 
for yourself. You got to let yourself off the hook and let go of your insecurities. You got to let go of the things that's holding you bound and you got to just simply trust God and say, yes, God, I want the more that you have for me. I want a life that walks in purpose. I want a life that is aligned with your will and your way and I'm not going to use my age as a limitation. I'm not going to use my vulnerabilities as a limitation. I'm not going to be stricken by my verbal, my anything that hinders me. But God, I'm going to trust you because you said there's more in me. Then God, I want you to get the more that you see out of me. Is there anybody in the room this morning that wants to be more, that want God to do more through your life? Then if you do, lift your hands and open up your mouth and say, God, make me who you want me to be. Look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor, get over yourself. What if Noah would have never got over himself? What if Abraham would have never got over himself? What if David would have never got over himself? What if Rachel and Deborah and Esther would have never got over themselves? What if all of these great, now that we call them great, men and women of faith that made mistakes, that didn't do everything right, but they said yes to God and look at who they became. And I want to let you know, there is no secret to what my God can do what he's done for others he'll do for you and I'm telling you here that I said yes to God with my introverted self and through God God has done amazing things and amazing works through me simply because I got over myself and you might not be able to see it but God sees it. Huh? Isn't that what we appreciate? All of us today are where we are because somebody saw something in us. Huh? I can still remember certain teachers in my early informative years that saw something in me. So they would jack me up in hallways. Miss Simmons and Miss Turner would say, come here, come here. Because they knew who my parents were. And so when I would be cussing in hallways with my friends, they'd say, come here, come here. Now why are you acting like that? Why are you talking like that? I would get upset then, but I appreciate it now. They were hard on me. They would check me. They wouldn't let me get away with nothing. Why? Because they saw something in me. And if I continued hanging out with knuckleheads that wasn't concerned about schoolwork and hanging in the hallways, getting in the fights and causing ruckus, I would have never graduated. Thank God that there's always people that can see more in you than you can see in yourself. And thank God that your pastor sees more than you. I know your story. You done talk to me. I don't know some of the stuff you done done. But thank God today God sent you to church on this second Sunday to simply remind you that he sees something in you. Can y'all help me preach for a moment and high five three people around you and say I see something in you. I see something in you. you this, God ain't through with you yet. There's more to your life. Girl, you about to become something in God. Boy, I see what God getting ready to do in your life. Listen, I know you came to church and I know I'm sitting next to you and you smell a like little something. I smell a little something on you, but that's all right. You here, but guess what? That ain't all that God is going to do in your life. There's, I God, I need somebody in here to just get in their spirit. I see something. Point at them, look them in the face and say, I see something in you. God sees something in you. Listen, that's why the devil couldn't kill you. That's why the mistakes, you're still surviving. It's because God sees something. I see something in you. And so today, you got to get over yourself. Gideon couldn't see it. I want to let you know, and I know you got questions, but can I give you this? Here's your tweet. Here's your Facebook post for the morning. 
Here it is. Y'all ready for it? Are y'all ready for it? God would have to turn his questions, his question marks into exclamation points. And I'm going to let you know. I know you got questions because you don't see it. And you got all these questions. How God going to use me? And God is getting ready to turn your question marks into exclamation points. Here's the last thing, and I'm done. Gideon, lastly, y'all, was looking at the wrong thing. <laughs> Gideon is looking at the wrong thing. Did you hear it? He's, he kept saying, how can I? How can I go and save Israel? When I'm the least in my father's house and I and our tribe is the weakest, Manasseh. I'm the least. Now, scholars suggest we don't know if Gideon is referring to the fact that he's the youngest in the house of his father's children, or if he's the only one that has that has not fully converted to Baal worship, and because of that, he is seemingly an outcast in his own family. Whatever the case is, here's the moral of it. Here's the bottom line. He has a low self-worth. <laughs> That's bottom line. He has a low self-esteem. He has a low value of himself. And he is looking at the wrong thing. So much to the point, y'all, as the story progresses, we'll get more into this on Wednesday night, me and Lady J. We'll get more into this on Wednesday night. He is so struggling with being able to see it. He turns around and he asks the angel to give him a sign. Because he's struggling in his faith to really embrace and see himself the way God sees him. And so he wants clarity. He wants to be sure. You know how we do. Well, if this is really the Lord speaking to me, I want the phone to ring. Don't act like you ain't never done that before. Because you want some sign. Because right now you're really struggling in your faith. Now here's what I love about God, and we'll talk more about this. I ain't got time to get into it. The Lord is patient. Because he said, okay, if this is really you, God, talking to me, I I'm going to prepare a sacrifice. Let me go get a sacrifice, and I'm going to lay it on this altar. And I'm, I'm going to see what you're going to do with this sacrifice. Just stay here. Stay here. He tells the divine angel, stay right here. Don't leave. I'm going to come back. I'm going to go get a sacrifice. Because I just need to really be sure I ain't crazy. And the angel says, go ahead. Go ahead. And he goes and gets a sacrifice. Gideon is looking at the wrong thing. Because he's missing the fact that nowhere did the angels say he was going by himself. I'm done. Gideon is looking at the wrong thing because he's looking at his weakness. <laughs> he's looking at his insecurities. And he's looking at what he can do in his limited strength. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you, you're looking at the wrong thing. You're focused on what you can do out of your own limitations and restrictions. You're missing the fact that you are not going to be able to accomplish anything without God working through you. I wish I had a witness here. In your own strength, you are nothing. In your own strength, you are weak. But in his strength, you got power. I wish I had somebody. That's why...
Paul picks up on this in Philippians 4 and 13 where he says, I can do all things. How? Through Christ that strengthens me. I wish I had a witness. Let's go ahead and shut this down. Don't focus on what you can do just yourself. But this is what I want to open you up to. What could your life be and who could you become in God if you just yielded yourself as we were singing earlier to God. Just yield yourself and give God the yes that he wants to get out of your life. And you open yourself up to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Can I tell you I, as a living witness when you just give God the yes that he wants from you what God will begin to do through you is going to simply blow your mind so stop focusing on what you can do like what Moses I'm a stutterer but Moses said listen I'm gonna give you a yes and look at what God did through Moses I want to tell somebody this morning stop focusing on your limitations and your restrictions and open yourself up to the power of God working in your life I wish I had a witness here don't be limited by your age, your gender, or your wealth, or your lack of. I don't care if you've been to school or no school. All you got to do is say yes to God. Yes, Lord, yes. I will trust you, and I'm going to obey you because I want you to use me for your glory. So let's shut the sermon down. God bless y'all. Have a great day. But can I tell you today, again, like I told you last Sunday, there is more to you, and I want to know this this morning do I have at least 10 people in here that's ready for the more have I been up here sweating and killing myself and I ain't got at least 10 people in the room today that wants to be more in God can I ask you a question are you ready to tell him yesterday make me more God are you ready to open and obey him and step out in faith today and trust that God has more for you and he wants to do more all through you so let's shut it down are y'all ready high five two people in the room today and let's go and tell them go after it 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 and watch what God will make you so today as we stand today Let's make a commitment that I don't want to live out of focus. I don't want to live out of focus. But the day God bring me into clarity. <laughs> bring me into clarity on what my purpose is. And the day God, I'm nervous. <laughs> I have more questions than I do answers. But here's what I want to simply tell somebody this morning. It just simply starts with you saying yes. <laughs> Woo. Yes, God. I trust you and obey. When your spirit speaks to me, when my whole heart I agree. I'm just going to simply tell you yesterday. That's where it starts. See that, that moment of yes. Ushers me into a place. To be open. To be free. From any hindrance. Any restrictions. When I preached my initial sermon, back when I was about, I think I was 19, by 19, I was scared to death. Mama Blow, I used to go back at times and look back at that VHS tape. That's what it was on, VHS. Feel that was the most jacked up. I listened to myself. I said, my God. That was a bad sermon. It was a short, bad sermon. 
But I stood in that church and I said yes to God. I said yes. <laughs> and I've been amazed at where God has taken that 19 year old Florida boy. The doors that have opened. Behind me saying yes, that God, I'm going to answer this call to preach. And my first opportunity to do anything was before I preached that initial sermon was at Union Bethel Church in Chesapeake where I was hanging out with my friend John Guns, who had just got called to this church and I was over in Norfolk State. And my first opportunity to do anything was extended by a lady by the name of Sister Baysmore. And she said, she looked at me and my cousin, she said, we need somebody to teach the teens. And they put me in a classroom, a little room with some teenagers. And I'm 19 myself. To teach Bible study on Wednesday nights. In that little room, that yes has opened doors for me to minister across this country. I'm telling you, I'm trying to get you to get this. That ain't just for me. It's for you. There's, there's so much more to my story. Can you just lift your hands as we get ready to go today? You're not done with me yet. Can you declare that this morning? You're not done with me yet. That's your that's your prayer. So much more to your story. Can you declare it? You're not done with me yet. You're not done with me yet. Come on, declare it. You're not, You're not done. done with me yet. Declare it. There's so much more. There's so much more to the story. Yes. You're not done with me. Real softly as we get ready to go. The first yes you got to give God, though. Here it is. The first yes that you got to give God is a yes of your life. It's a yes of your life. It's a yes of your life. What do you mean, Sheridan? This is what I mean. Have you said, yes, God, I'm going to trust you with my life. I, I, I believe that you died. I, you sent your son, Jesus, to save us. And today, I want to surrender my life to you. I want to be saved. I want to be saved. I want to accept you as my Lord and Savior. And I want to let you know if you're a teenager, I don't care what your age is, today God says, give me that yes. Surrender your life to me. Accept me as your Lord and Savior. Today, accept the salvation that I have made possible through my son Jesus Christ on that cross. Admit that you were a sinner, but I've saved you by grace. And today you want to be saved. In a moment, I'm going to just ask you simply just to raise your hand. Your hand raises your yes. If you're here today and you need to rededicate your life to Jesus and you want to come back to God today, and say, yesterday, God, I want to restore, I want to get reconciled, and I want to come back to you. Thirdly, if you need a church home, if you need a place to grow and be anchored in, I don't want you to just to date us and to hang out. If you're online, today, I want you to make a commitment. God is a God of covenant. He's a God of commitment. Today, you need to make a commitment. You need to make a commitment and say, yes, this is going to be my church. That's going to be my pastor. And I'm ready to lock in, and I'm ready to grow, and I'm ready to become. If that's a yes that you need to give the Lord today, I want you to just simply lift your hand and say, yes, today, I want to give my life to Jesus. Yes, today, I want to get, I want to come back to God. Yes, today, I want to make this my church. If that's you, just lift that hand. Say, yes, to, yes, this, that's my yes I need to give. If that's your yes, you don't have to say nothing else. Your hand in the air is your yes. Just lift that hand and say, yes. Your hand up is your yes. Who is God talking to today? Who needs to make that decision? Who needs to make that decision today? Just lift that hand. If you're online, fill out that link right where you are. In Jesus' name. Can we thank God for a saved house today? Come on, let's thank God. As hands are lifted, 
Father, I thank you today for the divine visitation. I thank you today for your word that is calling us out of where we are to become the more that you see in us. And I thank you today, God, that we leave out of this place with greater focus, with greater determination, with greater intention to become everything that you're calling us to be. In Jesus' name, we say together, amen. Come on, give God praise. Have an amazing week. God bless you. Sing that all the way to your car. You're, You're not, not done, done with me. me. There's so much more. There's so much more to the story. You're not done with me. You're not done with me.